experience. Welcome. This is Your Inner Experience, the sibling podcast to Acid Horizon. With us today, we have Micah. Micah is a critical psychologist who's currently in grad school, and Micah is also familiar with the work of James Hillman. Micah reached out to us uh, after hearing some of our Inner Experience episodes, and probably he heard us talk about James Hillman. And I knew that sooner or later, somebody would simply gravitate to us just on the basis of that name. That's how the Hillmanian community works. <laughs> and so <laughs> I just want to get started um, with a few questions. So welcome, Micah. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Happy to be here. The first thing that I hope that you could do, it'll be like a big package question here. Tell us a little bit about your work. Maybe tell us what critical psychology is or liberation psychology. And could you do so in the context of your relationship to the work of James Hillman? How did you come to that? How does that factor into what you're doing, uh, your dissertation proposal that you sent to us? Let us know. So I've actually kind of talked about this on another podcast, so I'm not going to sort of relay the whole story, but I will say that uh, you know, so my background is in literature. I studied English, and then I also kind of started studying psychology uh, toward the end of my undergrad. And it was a big difference kind of going from literature to naturalistic psychology. I just kind of hated it. I hated psychology. I hated mainstream psychology, naturalistic psychology, both in its kind of academic variant and then also in its clinical variant i was i was doing some work at a mental health clinic as a tech i didn't like what i saw there either it was strange going from studying literature and, and fiction and, and writing about sort of the meaning of these novels that i was reading and you know having enjoyed literature since i was really young it was strange going from that to like behaviorism you know and like now we're going to talk about inputs and outputs and, uh, you know, operant conditioning and stuff. It was, it was, it was, it felt like a, a huge sort of loss of meaning in the, the transmission uh, going from literature to normal psychology. So I think that that was the kind of background that I was coming from. Um, and I, I don't know exactly how I found what I found, but I, I eventually sort of came across humanistic psychology which is grounded in, you know, existentialism, phenomenology. And to me, it was a, a huge relief. It was like, oh, so now we can kind of take experience seriously. We can sort of take the human condition seriously. Um, so that was, you know, fantastic. And I, I found a grad school that specialized in humanistic psychology and existentialism and phenomenology, uh, which is where I'm doing my PhD now at the University of West Georgia. Um, there's not too many of these schools, by the way, there's like, you know, three or four in the US, something like that. So I, I found humanistic psychology, I found existentialism and phenomenology. And I found Hillman around the same time. I think it was probably some I was I was kind of networking with some some humanistic psychology people through Facebook, the division 32 of the American Psychological Association is the Society for Humanistic Psychology. And I joined their Facebook group, and it was pretty active. And so I was talking to people there. Uh, and there were people who were sort of giving me like a reading list, you know, like, because I was curious, and I wanted to know more. And Hillman happened to be one of the people that they recommended, uh, specifically his book, Revisioning Psychology, which is still probably top three favorite books for me in, in terms of nonfiction. There, there was a, kind of some precursor to that. I, I was interested in Freud, and I was interested in Jung. I'd read them in English courses. You know, you don't you don't read those guys in psychology courses anymore unless you're at a weird program. So that I had a little precursor to my interest in Hillman. I'd, I'd read a little bit of Jung uh, and I'd been very curious. I was I was really interested in myth. I was really interested in storytelling and narrative. I had a psychedelic phase, you know, and psychedelics and Jung and that sort of stuff goes together pretty well. I imagine that a lot of people who are listening right now might have a better handle on the work of Freud and Jung, mm. um, and maybe even their psychoanalytic praxis. How does Hillman differ theoretically and practically speaking? It's a good question. So 
you know, Hillman has a, a critique of Freud, uh, and and some maybe Lacanians. I have some Lacanian friends might argue that um, it's more of a critique of sort of American understandings of Freud uh, than Freud himself. But uh, Hillman has a critique of Freud, which is essentially that Freud wanted, and this is uh, close to a direct quote. Freud wanted to mine the quarry of the unconscious. He wanted to get in there, extract everything he could, bring it up into consciousness, and sort of use it, essentially, bring it to consciousness. And Hillman says, well, what about the unconscious? What about the quarry? He was really interested in viewing unconscious material and treating unconscious material on its own terms, rather than sort of trying to interpret it, rather than trying to sort of appropriate it from an ego standpoint. So I, I kind of see it as a, a almost a type of phenomenology, where it's sort of Husserlian a little bit. It's like, let's let's go to the things themselves. Let's go to the images themselves. And there's a way in which we try to preempt ourselves either as analysts or analysands from the hermeneutical task of appropriating it and instrumentalizing the the discourse that's generated out of our contact with the images. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you, you see you see the most sort of vulgar example of this. And like, you know, if you buy like a, a symbolism dictionary where it's like, oh, yeah, if, if you dream about snakes, then, you know, that's the penis and that kind of stuff. Um and of course, you know, most analysts are probably going to be more sophisticated than that. Um, but Hillman was really stressing, like, like the ego should not be the priority. He would consider the ego an archetype. And, he, you know, he talks about like Hercules as a sort of uh, maybe example of the kind of modern Western ego consciousness. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with the ego, but for him, it's one archetype among many. And so he wants to get away from this kind of ego focus and consciousness focus. Regarding the, the he's saying about the a critique of the American reception of Freud, are you kind of talking about the way he's been received in basically American capitalism, the, the Edward Bernays idea of, I'm going to take these theories, I'm going to dig all this stuff out of the unconscious, bring it to a kind of fixity, and then redeploy it to center all around these notions of self. You know, think about the, the Adam Curtis documentary, The mm -hmm. Century of the Self, the invention yeah. of the self from mm -hmm. this American commercialization of psychoanalysis where you try to, you essentially use it in the industrial sense. Is, it, is, it, is Hillman's critique a kind of critique of the industrial use of Freud, the use and abuse of, of Freud for life in the way that Edward <laughs> Bernays did in the invention of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of PR, of propaganda? I think that's that's one element of it, and it's probably the most overt element of it. Um, I think Hellman, he's definitely focused on sort of the American context. I would say he's probably talking more about like ego psychology and sort of the the school of thinking. You know, uh, you have psychoanalysts like Kohut and people like that who sort of valorize the self a little bit. But I think that the political piece is important. And Hillman actually became a Marxist later in his life, which I haven't read a whole lot about it, but um, he, there's a really good interview where he talks about it. But yeah, so, so probably yes and. You know, there's this kind of overt piece, which is what happened with Bernays, where he's like literally bringing it into uh, advertising and, you know, probably uh, industrial organizational psychology. But then there's also this kind of covert piece, which is just like maybe the more like Foucauldian sort of uh, creation of a type of subject, which, you know, is for capitalism and matches up with capitalism. Yeah. If that helps. I don't know if I answered your question. Oh, no, very, very much. And I think in terms of the ego psychology aspect, I think I wonder how much it ties in, because I'm quite new to Hillman, with Hillman's idea of the, the hero. Mm. as the heroic thing that fixes these things, ends dialogues. It's the, it's almost seems a little bit almost like a redeployment of possibly messianic archetypes, you know, the one mm. that brings the true meaning to things. And I wonder if we can get a bit deeper into Hillman by talking about this heroic aspect which tries to cut off dialogue and maybe even reflects upon the traditional role of the analysts themselves, you know, the person who is coming in to save, <laughs> save the ego from its turmoil by bringing all of these things up from the unconscious and, ta-da, you want to have sex with your mother. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and I should give a little shout-out to uh, my Lacanian friends because I, 
I do think that Lacan does something different than that, which is which is pretty cool. One starting point for us here, like kind of resetting for a moment. Imagine we have something like a nightmare. And I know one of the things that Hillman talks about are daymares, those uh, sort of instantaneous flash of lightning fantasies that we have that just imagining ourselves in a car crash with our best friend kind of thing mm. um, or some other sort of like, you know, horrific tragedy uh, could strike you at any moment. And that could be seen as a kind of content that one would bring into the analytic space. But take like a nightmare, for example, going into a Jungian analyst and I have some experience. I, I was in analysis for a while, kind of as a tourist, not because I had mm. an issue, but I, I'm sure something would have come up at some point, right? That's how it goes, right? But um, imagine I go in with a nightmare and I tell my, my nightmare to the analyst. They're going to start unpacking things. They're mm -hmm. going to have me make free associations. It's, it's very likely that the analyst is going to bring in stories and myth and things like that in order to perhaps elicit other connections that I would, as the dreamer, as the analysand, would you know be sort of lured into or baited into, and that would sort of develop the story. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is, is a kind of hermeneutics, right? Yeah. We're, we're attempting to find a meaning or derive a meaning from these images. Now, in the process of doing that, there's a departure from the, the image or the dream, mm -hmm. certainly the dream event, mm -hmm. and perhaps even the, the image qua image. Now, what Hillman wants to do is he wants to place us in this sort of psychical ecology with images. Now, what would a Hillmanian archetypal psychologist do that might be different than, let's say, a Jungian or a Freudian in such a context? Yeah, it's a good question. So I, I actually took a, a class uh, on Jung in my grad program where we, we did some collective dream work together. Uh, and it was really interesting. And, and the professor would kind of do this conventional move of like, well, you know, sometimes this means this. And, and he would kind of sort of help us unfold a story. I think Hillman is really interested, as you said, in sticking with the image. So rather than, you know, and he does talk sometimes about making associations and he talks in the, the animal presences uh, work about amplifications and stuff. Um, but he's, he's really interested in staying with the image. So, for example, if someone came in with uh, uh, a nightmare about, um, okay, well, I, I could share a little personal thing. I actually had a, a, a dream about Hillman uh, a few years ago. And in this dream, he, he tried to come on to me, uh, and I'm straight, uh, and he, and so, so I was like, no, like, I don't, I don't want this. And he, he kept kind of pressing. And so I had to get out a gun and shoot him. James! <laughs> <laughs> End of episode. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I actually did mention that to uh, one of my uh, professors and sort of mentors and uh, clinical mentors at the time. And, and he did this kind of conventional move where he was like, oh, like, you know, it sounds like maybe some there's something around boundaries that you need to work on, or there's something around uh, expertise where you're, you know, you need to kill the father or whatever. Um, but from a, a Hillmanian perspective, and there can be value to that, but from a Hillmanian perspective, you might in session sort of draw up the figures and the dream scene and I might, they might ask me to have a dialogue with Hillman, uh, maybe even his, you know, dead body since I killed him. But he might be speaking from the bullet wound, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you, you can you you sort of follow the trail wherever it leads, you know, wherever the kind of psychic uh, uh, significance is, and you sort of just pay attention to that and you ask questions of that. So like, say, Hillman, what, what did you want from me? What were you trying to do in seducing me? Uh, and then maybe I would talk about how I feel about that and what that means for me, right? So it's, it's very, in my mind, phenomenological, where it just cleaves very closely to experience rather than bringing in, you know, maybe there's father issues here. Maybe there's boundary issues. You don't get a sense that anything has a finality or a complete circumscription mm -hmm. and it leaves the image open and it, and it leaves it alive. As long as we're alive, we're probably having dreams and fantasies too. So it keeps the ecology, um, you know, 
I, I guess you say perforated or porous in some sense. Mm. Um, that's that's interesting. I mean, I in in my Jungian analytic practice, I mean, it, it wasn't uncommon for me to do something like that now and again. There would often be like a little vignette where the analyst would say, okay, let's just have a little conversation with that right now, mm -hmm. right? It would almost be like a breakout moment. Well, this does kind of, it does come from Jung a little bit because this is this is active imagination type work. Exactly, and that's that's actually what I wanted to bring up. There's a, there's a famous book for those who are interested in this work by Robert Johnson called Inner Work. And um, I remember going through that thing studiously like 15 years ago, you know, and doing active imagination mm. sessions. And it's it's pretty profound. Even just doing that on your own, like you could spend 10 minutes of your life speaking to a dream image. And if it's the first time you've done it, it might sort of like break the seal, mm, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You might you might hear something or feel something that you wouldn't ordinarily have felt had you not, you know, sort of set up this tableau for yourself. Mm -hmm. Maybe to, to shift gears a little bit, because um, you had asked about critical psychology and maybe the relationship mm. between Hellman and critical psychology. Uh, so critical psychology is basically... Uh, a type of psychology that's deeply suspicious of normal psychology, mainstream psychology. Uh, it, it can come in from a lot of different angles. So you can have feminist critical psychology. You can have anti-racist critical psychology. You can have Marxist critical psychology. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's sort of always in critical response to a lot of the, the trends in normative psychology. And so, you know, I would, I would consider myself like an anti-capitalist critical psychologist. Uh, and there's a lot of really cool people in this uh, lineage, let's say. I would say if you could share names like of authors and, and things like that at the end, I'll certainly put those in the show notes. I'm, I'm sure people will be very interested in that. Yeah. So there's there's a there's a few kind of household names in critical psychology these days. I think Ian Parker uh, is a big name. He's a Lacanian, Foucauldian uh, critical psychologist in the UK. Uh, Thomas Teo is really good for sort of a, a very theoretical uh, take on things. Uh, there's some people I don't know as well, but I think they've been really important. Uh, Holtzkamp, who's a German critical psychologist, uh, Marxist. Need to read him. Uh, but yes, there's, there's a whole kind of ecosystem of thinkers who have... Uh, in the past kind of helped this tra tradition along and then also now kind of are at the forefront of it. One of the challenges that I came up against when reading the Mary Watkins piece that you mm. forwarded to us, which I'll also include in the show notes, uh, first off, that essay was just a great, like that could serve as an introduction to James Hillman, yeah. right? That that could be something that's put in, I don't know, like the best of, you know, the collected works of James Hillman. Yeah. That could be like the first essay in there. And um, a lot of, I, I really appreciated the vignettes. Uh, I'm not sure if you knew this about me, but I taught philosophy and other subjects in uh, prison. Mm. And I also work with at-risk youth right now. And so some of the stories definitely sort of piqued my interest and, and made me think, okay, now that I know, like 15 years ago, this wasn't happening in the way that I see it happening now. Mm. But now it seems like there's a breadth of information that can be accessed uh, and experienced that like, okay, now maybe I can sort of like bring these threads into my own pedagogy, right? One of the challenges that I had was there was a certain activist element to it. And you said that you were an anti-capitalist critical psychologist. That was one thing that I think the Watkins essay was somewhat lacking in. There was mm -hmm. definitely a support for indigenous peoples. There was an anti-racist element. I would even say that there was um, a pro-ecology. There's like a couple permaculture things in there, too. This is, I think, the the one challenge for just psychoanalysis in general. I mean, you get this with Deleuze and Gattari, too, mm -hmm. is how do we bridge the divide between what happens in the clinical space and what happens at large in the activist space? And in my own Jungian psychoanalysis, my analyst leaned away from any sort of political content. Of course, up, of course. Right. <laughs> and, and like, I mean, with like, he was wincing. So I, I'm curious, like, I'm not sure what your trajectory is going to be, you know, either as a researcher or analyst, but how might an anti-capitalist critical psychologist handle things that come up, handle like the dream content that you brought up, for example, or, or anything else for that matter? Yeah, well, there's, there's a theme 
and this occurs in both Hillman and then Mary Watkins takes it up uh, around the sort of conservatism of Jungian thinking and maybe even some psychoanalytic thinking too around the outside world, right? It, it's, mm. it's very tempting as an analyst, uh, especially more conventional, to, to, for everything that's brought up in session to be grist for the mill of the sort of intra-psychic what's going on in people's mind, how does it reflect on their psychic organization? Uh, and, and both Hellman and Mary Watkins critique this, and I think they're right to. So, you know, for example, Watkins tells a story about having dreams of a sort of nuclear apocalypse in, I think, the 80s. And this was yeah. at a time when, you know, there were Cold War fears in the culture. And, and she really resisted this idea of like, this, this is just about me and my own life and my own psychic organization. Like, no, this is about the world. Like there are real existential terrors and threats and anxieties that we should listen to and then kind of hopefully allow to move us in some way. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, <laughs> really resistant to the sort of uh, individual individualization uh subjectivism of a lot of sort of psychology in general, and then also definitely a lot of psychoanalysis and union thinking. I mean, I, I think the the clinic in some ways should be exploded. That's where Will, our other co-host, will probably come in. <laughs> <laughs> He's the the resident Foucauldian. I was, I was just going to say, I mean, I am a Foucauldian. I would say that Foucault is probably, along with Hillman, one of my sort of two main thinker pillars and what I do. So, yeah, I wonder, you know, because when it comes to, to Foucault and uh, the notion of psychiatric domain, right, we get this idea in uh, Foucault's 1974 lectures that with the generalization of what we could call like um, the psychological inquisition of the subject, right? And the expansion of, of psychiatric power across the social body more generally. After your engagements with Hillman, the the critical uh, psychology milieu, and then importantly Foucault, and and explicitly there seems to be at least in your proposal an interest in sort of his late seventies lectures. So we're already dealing with the the implications of the research into um, psychiatric power abnormality uh, his his re uh, articulation of some of the core notions of Kangilan. How did you then look back at some of your clinical work? What changed in your experiences educationally with clinical psych after your engagement with Foucault and Hillman? It's a great question. Uh, you know, I have a, a friend who was planning to do clinical work, encountered Foucault and said, screw this, I'm not going to be a clinician. I have, a, you know, multiple takes on it. I mean, in the interview where, where Hillman talks about being a Marxist, he also says that he views therapists as sort of picking up the pieces of, of what capitalism leaves in the streets, you know, the people on the margins that it sort of just doesn't give a shit about. So there's a part of me that, that, that sees especially depth kind of psych approaches to therapy that really emphasize... Um, you know, the nobility and autonomy of the person. Uh, there's a part of me that, that sees those as still having value. But of course, there's another part of me that thinks that all therapy, all psychoanalysis is really just kind of the handmaiden to, to capitalism. And when I say explode the clinic, you know, I, I, I mean, like, going inside out, you know, there's a, there's a popular saying among therapists that every therapist should be should be trying to work themselves out of a job, you know, in the sense that we want it, we want to heal people, and then we want them to no longer need us. And I, I think there is something noble about that. And I, I think, you know, every culture in history has had healers. So I, I think some critical people can be a little too fast about wanting to jettison the healing professions, and the healing roles. But I think it has to be like drastically reconceived, you know, like we need to think about community work rather than individualistic work. We need to think about a psychology that that's sort of adjunctive to anti-capitalist efforts, to political efforts, 
some of the work that I've done in kind of anarchist spaces has been trying to help build solidarity, help build community, because we're all suffering in, in Western cultures, you know, particularly America, we're all suffering from, you know, some of the effects of individualism. There's a really good critical psychologist named Todd Sloan, a really good book called Damaged Life, where he talks about how under this sort of current Western era, we have like psychodynamic barriers to participating in, in community in ways that maybe other cultures don't. So I, I think that, you know, this is some of the work that I've done. I think we need to conceive of clinical work as like a community project and like solidarity building project rather than uh, individual adaptation, rehabilitation. And it seems like this kind of social aspect, the social healing aspect of psychoanalysis is part of, sort of the internal dialectic of the very history of psychoanalysis. Because if we take simply take Freud, you know, starts working with these really sort of bourgeois patients, meaning not the wolfman, quite sort of an aristocratic figure. And then at the limits of Freudian psychoanalysis, you have someone like Wilhelm Reich, who, have someone who takes mm -hmm. it into the social field, takes the, the Freudian aspects into the Marxist parties, gets thrown out of all of them, but you know, he, does, he does do that. And then at the same time, you have, you know, the, the Canian school, the limits of that stands to Lars and Guattari, where, you know, it, the, during 68, Lacan just wasn't having any of it. People were throwing Wilhelm Reich books at cops, and Lacan was saying, you just want a new master? And then the last guitar says, well, if he's right, where do we go from here? And it seems like with um, Hillman, there's also this kind of limit at the extreme of psychoanalysis, which he sort of inverts methodologically in terms of really exacerbating the role of the psychoanalyst as a listener that turns it into the talking mm. cure. That's what, it's where the idea of attention comes from. It's a very, um, also a bit of a, a post 60s sort of Ram Das kind of thing, you know, being with, be here now kind of thing. <laughs> where if, if, you, if you actually yeah. listen to the subject's worries and pay attention to even those little externalities to the unconscious that come out in speech, you end up entering the entire in souls aspect of the social world, the subjectivity within the social. And it seems like this is a, this is a really critical point for the practice of psychology and psychoanalysis now. Uh, psychoanalysis now. Because we're hitting that limit again in the arrival of this this clinical term I keep I, I see about occasionally you know SLS shit life syndrome mm. the very boundaries <laughs> of like, I cannot help you here I mean I, I yeah here, here's here's some Xanax and a copy of the Anarchist Cookbook you know go at it son yeah and there's there's some even even like mainstream people are kind of latching on to the fact that like you know it. it psychological problems really are biopsychosocial. There's this model that's been they've been trying to push for a long time. And it's always been a little bit wishy washy, I think. But you know, for example, the United Nations is moving toward what they call social determinants of health, as sort of really important in considering physical health as well as psychological health. You know, like we can't ignore poverty, we can't ignore immigration, we can't ignore all these these social and economic issues. Yeah, and, and I, I'm also really influenced by institutional psychotherapy. Uh, I say guattari. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know what I'm talking about. I've just always heard it guattari, but, but I'm, I'm definitely influenced by his work and the work he was doing at Laborde. That's, that's a hard thing to do these days. There's a lot of restrictions legally, institutionally, financially, but I, I, I do think we need more of that kind of work more of the work that tries to marry the, the psychic and the social. I, I see a significant overlap between what James Hillman's project is and what Deleuze and Gattari were striving for. I mean, I won't say that Hillman is schizoanalytic by the definition, mm. but a lot of the things that he's doing are, are, are very much like that. And maybe this is a good time in the discussion to talk about some of the praxis of James Hillman. This concept of noticing and attentiveness, because it seems from that concept, we come out of the inner realm and into the outer realm. Not only that, this concept of noticing and attentiveness is one which builds the sort of paradigm, if we want to say both an individual and maybe even a communitarian or a, a social paradigm by which we're able to recognize and uh, problematize you know, certain social issues. Maybe, maybe we can say something about that. Maybe we can talk about that with reference to like one of the central tenets of uh, Hillman, which is one of the important things that he says is that adaptation to malignant conditions is itself a kind of psychopathology. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, 
you know, let's put the pieces together here with this, this idea of noticing and attentiveness. How does that preempt the sort of adaptation that would, to use D&G terms, re-territorialize the very same problems that we experience as individuals and as a society? What is it about that practical method that, that gets us out of the problems or at least gets us on the road to finding solutions that work? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And this is, you know, you guys are helping me out here. This is something that I I've I've had a hard time reconciling in my work where I, I feel like I'm a I'm a Hillman person and then I'm a critical psychologist and I don't quite know how to, to put them together. Um but you know, I could just give an example. I was at I was at a, a, a conference of therapists uh, a few months ago and we were doing sort of therapeutic work with one another. We were doing process-oriented group therapy. And I, I sort of suggested that maybe we could do some collective dream work. And yeah, I, I just, it just came to me and, and uh, people were like, sure, let's do it. And what happened was fascinating. You know, it, it just in terms of like somebody would, would mention a dream that they had, and then we would discuss you know, they, we would discuss both what the, what the dream might mean for that person in their life, but also what the dream might mean for us in the room right now. Like, why is it coming up right now for this person? What does it speak to how you're feeling right now, imminently with the others in here? And in, in terms of like building bridges between people, if I'm, if my thesis around, you know, that we're sort of individualistic silos is correct. It's just, it's amazing what that sort of imaginal type sort of presence or, or um, space that people can go into. It, it's amazing what it can do for people in terms of building more of a communitarian ethos. And I, I should also say here, I'm, I'm really influenced by a book called Original Wisdom by uh, Robert Wolf. I have some anthropologist friends who might want to crucify me for recommending this book because I, I don't know if it's very anthropologically sensitive or accurate. Um, but it was a psychologist who went and lived with some uh, an indigenous village. But one of the things that they would do every morning is they would wake up and they would immediately, you know, and they had sort of collective sleeping arrangements. They would wake up and they would immediately start sharing their dreams. Hmm. And they would use that to figure out like what the hell they should do during the day. Interesting. It was sort of like their their collective imaginal compass for, you know, what's going on in their lives, what needs to be addressed, what direction should we go in? I mean, I do um, almost the exact opposite every morning, get up and see who I need to combat on Twitter. Like, <laughs> so, but no, those those sorts of things interest me because, I mean, I hate to sort of invoke this this trope, but to the Western mind, or at least to the, the modern American and modern Anglophone and European mind, these things seem counterintuitive. There's a little mm -hmm. bit of hesitation or embarrassment about like, okay, hey, what was your dream all about? You know, <laughs> could yeah. you imagine? I mean, there, there, there is this whole sort of Lynchian thing that happens when somebody speaks a dream, right? And this is one thing that I've just noticed my whole life where, you know, instantly everybody's attention is raised to the details of a dream. It's almost, I mean, this is pure speculation, but it's almost like it's encoded within our DNA to hear this kind of story, right? Yeah. Or at least it, it's deeply encoded within our culture. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just fascinating. Adam, yeah, go ahead. So I just think it's, it's just very, because there's, there's that common line you hear that if you want to bore somebody, tell them your dreams. Yeah. And it does, it does, it, it's incredibly weird because I think the boredom, if anything, is a kind of an effect of the, uh, the phrase and its common, out, common usage rather than an inherent boredomness of dreams themselves. Because think about some of the early uh, fantasy stuff, so Lord Dunsany or Lovecraft's dream cycle. It's, it's all pure dream, even yeah, David Lynch. This, the dreams have this sort of fascinating aspect. And I think in terms of how we consider our relationship to the symbolic and our own forms of mental imagination. It's almost like you know, waking up from a dream and taking about it. It's almost like saying, where you went on holiday. This whole, you, know, <laughs> you was there as well. Uh, oh, yes, this holiday was so weird. You was there. I mean, it's all these crazy things. And it's, like, it, it's, it's weird that the very font of imagination is so, it's almost treated as a priori boring. Well, I think, I think this gets to a point that Hillman rails against, which is what he calls literalism. I think we treat dreams literally really often, you know, and say, 
and I've had this experience, you guys probably have too, where you tell somebody a dream or somebody tells you a dream and you kind of want to like just get to the point already. And then you want to like get to like, okay, well, if it's a friend of yours or something like, well, what does that mean? Like, let's, 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 you know, hammer this out. What does it mean for your life? Like, let's skip all the dream stuff and just get for, get to what it means. Uh, and Hillman would say, no, 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 like slow down. Like, don't, don't ask what it means. Don't ask what it can do for you. Let's talk to it. Let's dialogue with it. Let's like stay in the dream space while we're awake. And I think that makes dreams fascinating. But if you, yeah, and, and that's what makes Lynch so great sometimes, right? It's how he sort of plays with the dream space. But it's, but it's, it's boring as hell if, you, if you're just sort of doing what we normally do around it. Yeah, I mean, the paradigmatic scene it happens in Mulholland Drive, right, where they're at the diner and the and Alice Ann just recounts the whole dream verbally. But then there's this shift where we're going to actualize the dream or perform it in a certain way. And if you don't get chills seeing that scene, at least in that transition... I mean, I doubt your humanity. No, I'm kidding. But uh, there, there is something that happens there in this shift from, okay, here's just a mere telling of a story. And here's the clinical ear sort of bent towards that story versus now the analyst becomes a sort of psychopomp or a figure in the dream who actually leads that person to the shadow or the image or whatever we want to call it. I have a few comments or a few quotes that I pulled from the Watkins essay, and I, I was hoping to get your reaction to them. The first one is on this idea of seeing through. So we, we, we did brush past the notion of noticing and attentiveness, that there's this ability to cultivate a, a sense of things that are maybe happening in the world, relations that are occurring, through lines between this person's suffering and that person's suffering, that as we work with dream images and live with them, these tensions get teased out. And then Hillman has this other concept, the concept of seeing through. I'd just like to read this and then maybe get your reaction to it. And maybe you could even say how you have experienced this either in you know research or like where, where have you seen like salient expressions of this in research or maybe even in clinical practice or your own practice. But Hillman says, first, there's a psychological moment, a moment of reflection, wonder, puzzlement initiated by the soul, which intervenes and countervails what we are in the midst of doing, hearing, reading, watching. With slow suspicion or sudden insight, we might move through the apparent to the less apparent. We use metaphors of light, a flicker, a slow dawning, a lightning flash, as things become clarified. When the clarity has itself become obvious and transparent, there seems to grow within it a new darkness, a new question or doubt requiring a new act of insight, penetrating again towards the less apparent. And it seems that what, that what Hillman's doing here is He's articulating this dialectic between a kind of lightness and darkness, clarity and doubt that we're ever like sort of reeled into. Um, how does that play out in the clinical space or maybe how has that played out in your own experiences undergoing analysis? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing it makes me think of, um, just to bypass your question a little bit, but hopefully I'll sure. get, get back to it. Um, the first thing it makes me think of is the distinction that he makes between spirit and soul. Um, where spirit is this kind of um, transcendent impulse where it's, it's trying to make order, it's trying to, it's, it's more linguistic, it's more um, formative. And then soul is this kind of, you know, and I don't, I don't want to start to sound too much like Jordan Peterson here, but uh, right. <laughs> but, and that's somebody else I want to get to at the end. So we'll, we'll yeah, we, sh that. we should. Yeah. Uh, and, and then soul or anima is kind of its opposite where it's like, this is the depths. This is, I think he says like, this is the mermaid that pulls the hero down into the water to ex uh, extinguish its certainty. And, and Hillman was a huge fan of anima and, and thought that it, it went underappreciated and sort of didn't wasn't isn't given its due by most psychology and it's a very difficult concept because it's not coextensive with an uh, the idea of like aphrodite or eros mm -hmm. or something like that it's actually an image of the unconscious itself mm -hmm. that for for men typically i mean at least for jung it was the case that for men man might appear as a woman right and and vice versa in the form of animus but it, it often expresses itself as a kind of a negative image of the actual dreamer, or the actual analysand, 
And that image provides a lure to bring you deeper and deeper into this process. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think maybe to, to try to answer your question a little bit, um, you know, something that I've been really interested in is negative theology. Um, specifically, just this sort of Keatsian emphasis on not knowing. And I think this is really at the heart of anima for, for Hillman and probably Jung too. It's like, there's, there's too much certainty, there's too much knowledge, there's too much positive knowledge. And this is something I, I draw from Foucault a little bit too, when he talks about care of the self versus knowledge of the self. I think we have a, a major overemphasis on knowledge of the self rather than care of the self, which is more about sort of, you can only receive truth through a transformation of yourself. You, you can't receive truth and remain the same. If you do remain the same, you're not receiving truth. I really like the invocation of negative theology there, because when, because when I was reading the uh, the snake is not a symbol, the idea of not trying to capture the the symbol of the snake with a fixed meaning, but living with it, you know, talking, mm -hmm. it, approaching it as an animal, I was thinking a lot of um, the the cloud of unknowing, mm -hmm. the mystical theology text. I think the fourteen hundreds or so, and it's about opening yourself up to just paying attention to the unknowing, the cloud of unknowing, and piercing it not in a sense of conception of the divine, but in a directional kind of attention. He calls it, you know, or he, the monk calls it, he calls it devotion. Um, and it really feels like you're getting this negative way by entering into this dialogue in which contact is not guaranteed in the same way that, you know, if, you, if one was simply looking at an animal, you know, a snake is not guaranteed to want to interact with you. It could just sliver along. And this does also get into the distinction between soul and spirit and just to transpose spirit into to German, you know, the word Geist. And I, I was watching a lecture on Hegel the other day, and apparently the one of the derivatives in English of the word Geist, which we often translate as spirit, is the word gist, to get the gist <laughs> ah, of something. Oh, interesting. Ah. And to get the gist, and that kind of makes it this idea of you know, the spirit as something is quite fixed as opposed to the primordial yeah. movements of the unconscious. So you get, you know, you're trying to force someone to the end of their dream. And what's the gist of this dream? Yeah, it's just the yeah. dream that you want to, you know, is it Oedipus at the end of it? And I think that's quite an interesting way of phrasing distinction, especially when it comes to the idea of attention and, and devotion and expanding that into a communal way of knowing in the absence of knowing, knowing negatively. Yeah, and of course, as a critical psychologist, I'm always going to come back to like, what what types of subjects are we being fashioned into for what purposes? And I And I do think there's a link between this sort of What's the gist of it? What's the what's the gist of our lives? What's the gist of the world that essentially serves capitalist functionality? You know, you, you can't linger too long. This is why Hegel's encyclopedia is only an encyclopedia in outline. He only gives you the geist of it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a concept in Hillman that I want to say saved my life. Mm. And this was many years ago. And it's actually the the opposition of the imaginal ego versus the heroic ego. I came to this material, you know, in my early 20s, you know, at a time at which I was living overseas. I was involved in uh, amateur combat sports. Mm. I was doing a lot of dude stuff and had mm. a lot of dude opinions and that sort of thing. So um, dudes rock, but I didn't always rock. These rock, yeah. But in my case, there's a time in, in a lot of young men's lives, and it might be around that time, between 22, 25, 26 years old, where there might be this creep of ennui or uncertainty mm. in which, um, you know, not only are you a kind of a, at a height of your vitality, or at least one of the peaks, it's paired with this sense of uncertainty about the world. At least it was in my case, and I have seen it in other young men. And... Now this brings me to somebody like Jordan Peterson, who often mm. invokes the name of Carl Jung. Peterson's Carl Jung takes, I think, are pretty weak sauce, at least the ones that I've heard. And in fact, I think the way that he tends to use Jung, and, and I could be wrong, maybe he has a more elaborate position on this, but it seemed more of an adornment of ego psychology using traditional images, right? It was sort of an invocation of the spirit of Jungian psychology, you know, as an aesthetic, maybe, yeah. you know, to sort of center this, I would say, hyper-capitalistic neoliberal idea of the self, the grind set mentality, right, mm -hmm. that, that we have today's. And in my case, I think 
it was a kind of incessant looming of that heroic impulse that brought to bear negatively on me. And it wasn't until I saw somebody like Hillman who taught us to kind of step back and, and witness and experience ourselves in an ecology of images, which to me, I think the implications for that are how can we exist in a world that isn't ego driven in the outer world, in the external world? How can we let the things be, you know, as we talked about in the, the Australian sense, right? Mm -hmm. But I think there's implications for this for colonialism and maybe even the decolonized movement and just the way that we view the ego itself. And I see somebody like Jordan Peterson, although, you know, in one breath, they kind of have a centrist liberal politics, mm -hmm. but also in some ways very dangerous because we don't see the danger in doubling down on that kind of ego psychology. And so I'm looking at somebody like Hillman as antidote to that tendency. And I was hoping maybe you had some comments on that or maybe if you've had the same thoughts as, as I have. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, first confession, I actually did like Jordan Peterson years ago. Uh, before, before the kind of, uh, transgender bill stuff came up, I used to watch his lectures. So, I mean, it, it's just because simply there's not a lot of psychologists in the mainstream talking about Jung. He also talks about existentialism, phenomenology. Uh, he talks a lot about Piaget and then he's got some boring sort of biological naturalism and evolutionary theory that he tries to like pull in together. He's very postmodern. So I, I had a period of, of, of having some respect for him. But yeah, I, I completely agree with your take. And, and I, I would I would want to look at the politics here. Like, what's he what's he what's he promoting? Where's he coming from politically? And it is like a, a classical liberal centrist type thing. And, you know, I don't I don't really want to get into the privilege narrative. But, you know, he is a privileged academic white dude who doesn't really have to worry about much. So the world is working pretty well for him. Well, not anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was going to say, at least ex externally, internally, and maybe intersubjectively, obviously, there's some been there's been some some dramatic, traumatic events in his life, uh, which isn't too surprising. If you do consider it from this kind of ego perspective, where he is, you, you know, I, I think Hillman would probably say that he's, uh, you know, spirit possessed. Like he's, even though he sort of does some nodding to Jungian thought and the unconscious and, and whatnot. I think, I think he's obsessed with uh, creating form and sort of explicating all of these principles. And, you know, I haven't read Maps of Meaning. I probably never will. But it's like he, he wants to have a theory of everything. He wants to, to have everything be solid, concrete, fixed. So yeah, I, I I think that's that's where it's coming from, and I and I get it. Like I I get why so many young guys are drawn to it, because it is a, it is a chaotic time. Uh, there's not a lot of like clarity around what a man should be in response to calls from popular feminism. Uh, so I get it, and and I should say that you know part of my work is actually in masculinity. I I, I just published a book chapter on nomadism and masculinity. And this is kind of where DNG comes in a little bit for me, where it's like there's a there's also a really good paper by Terrence, not Terrence McKenna. <laughs> uh, I don't remember his Blake. name. Terrence, Terrence Blake. No, it's not Terrence Blake. I do I do like his work. Uh, it's a it's a guy in Canada who's a Deleuzian, and he essentially says like we don't know what a man can do. Hmm. We don't know what a man can be. Uh, and I've I've tried to take that principle into some of my sort of community clinical work with men. And, you know, I, mm. so for example, I, I, I don't come in in the work I've done. I don't come in and say, all right, well, uh, you know, there's, there's toxic masculinity. You shouldn't be this. Instead, you should be sensitive. You should be blah, blah, blah. I don't do any of that. Right. I, I, I just want to work with the images. I just want to mm. work with what they bring, their feelings, their, their thoughts, their fantasies, uh, and see what happens, you know? And I, that's where I like DNG a lot for this kind of stuff. You don't want to say, you know, you can return to this archetype, this great hero aspect. You can be this, you know, in the traditional way. Look at someone like Joseph Campbell, you know, put yourself into that hero's narrative. It's more like the, the radical openness you get with someone like De yeah, Deleuze, Tari, Spinoza. We do not know yet what you could do. And that's a sort of a very affirmative move of saying, well, you don't have to go back and you don't have to stay here. You know, you can't go home, but you can't stay here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's that radical openness, I think, really escapes a lot of the 
the the archetypal fixity that I think you know, someone like Peterson is very you know, good at espousing. Yeah, and it's scary, and I get that. the The thing that's important for me is that it's partly scary because we're required to be these sort of super strong, boundaried individual people. I don't think it would be quite so scary if we were working together in a more communitarian sense, if there wasn't so much economic precarity, uh, all this kind of stuff. I'm curious about your take on um, the gender aspect here, too, because if we're using D&G and we're using Hillman and and the concept of masculinity, I, I wonder... There's an obvious reaction, or there's a noted reaction anyway, to the whole Jordan Peterson narrative, which is this abolition of masculinity. (laughs) And I think from both um, D&G and Hillmanian terms, there's a danger there because there's a life in masculinity. And in the sort of D&G sense of things, like that the concept of masculinity might exist in the life of an individual or a community as a kind of lively node that we pass through. I think the danger is when this thing becomes dominant when it becomes a figure that oppresses other figures to the you know exclusion only of itself. And so I, I'm, I'm curious how your work incorporates the notion of maybe gender abolition, you know, vis-a-vis Hillman and, and D&G. Yeah. Well, one thing I'll say is that it, I find it a little bit unfortunate um, that Hillman was so involved with some of the mythopoetic men's movement stuff in like the 80s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, again, I get it. Uh, but I, I don't have very uh, fond feelings toward those people and what they were doing and with the you know mankind project and stuff now. Um, I, I used to be a little bit more of a, a gender abolitionist, but then I realized that like this only works in like queer theory land. you know, this only works like in in academia, like interesting. Masculinity is here, and I, yeah. I, I don't think it's going anywhere. And of course, you know, it's it varies cross culturally and, and whatnot. So I, I I went more toward um, I don't want to say the middle, but I but I went toward a sort of nomadism that's like, you know, we don't have to reject masculinity as long as and this goes along with what you're saying, Craig. If if we can sort of get unfixed a little bit to where we can let ourselves be pulled in other directions, pulled by other forces, uh, so that we're not just this one sort of heroic masculine thing, then I think there's there are things about masculinity that are fine. And I, I was actually influenced by Zizek a little bit here, because he, he, he wrote an essay saying, you know, like, this this sort of impetus to, to make men more sensitive and stuff, like, that's a disaster, as like, as its own imperative, you know. I kind of have that in my notes here, too, because I, I think that the project that Hillman wants to institute uh, in terms of, you know, living and relating with images is directly contrast to the notions of like, OK, how can we be more empathetic? Let's import this massive dose of empathy right now and let's let it just sit on top of anything else in you that is alive, like a stone slab, right? And then people will become resentful of having done so, right? Yeah. It doesn't seem to have the same positive intensity. Yeah, I do I do like this idea of a sense, I guess it's, I'm putting it in sort of my own category kind of terms, the idea of the affirming the plasticity of gender across the gender spectrums, gendered categories, and unlo- unlocking the plastic potentialities of masculinity to self-differentiate. I think I think that's that's quite aligned with a lot of the of certain kind of gender abolitionist writings in terms of blowing up masculinity in terms of abolishing the fixity elements. Yeah, right. Abolishing because uh, if you think of gender as a kind of uh, a normative force that constrains our sort of individualizing and collective self-expression capacities in advance, I think yeah, that it's quite very much a line there in terms of plasticity to kind of the the plastic explosive that sits at the core of the unconscious, which we can sort of let out in a they're blowing up the clinic because you know the plastic and plastic explosive is an adjective, <laughs> not a not a, a fixed you know material noun. And yeah, in terms, of, I think this is where I think it really does work with this idea of we don't know what a man can do yet because that is the plasticity, the fundamental future orientation of that gender position, which it doesn't quite know. And I think maybe if I mean even if you use this idea of noticing, you can sit the idea of masculinity and sort of see all the ways in which one intimately transgresses one's idea of what one is, what is to be a man. I mean, it's, I mean, Zizek, um, for all his um, 
unusual Lacanian positions on these issues. He does say, like, you know, sometimes I look at the, 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 the you know, the markers and the doors, and it's, well, I don't know. I'm like, that's the only honest goddamn <laughs> position. <laughs> Thank you. Like, it's, there's a specific kind of, in a way, masculinity is self-escaping, but in the same way that it escapes itself, it's also self-shaping like other kinds of gender. Just masculinity has always been so unlocked up within itself. It's never fully quite embraced those aspects. Which is why it thinks it can only ever return to these pre, you know, these these pre-modern models, which you find with um, uh, Kermit, Kermit the Frog. Sorry, Jordan Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> and I think part of the project of knowing what uh, masculinity can do is something that I worked on when working in a in a prison context, doing a class that was entitled Building Resilience. I didn't like the name of the class, but the kinds of things that we did there were nice, which was to see, for example, the the sort of architecture and conduits of the male emotions, how men process all kinds of emotions through the filter of anger, right? And how mm. the notion of grief is something that registers very late in this process in many cases. And I think that's part of knowing what a man's body can do, seeing how it has been situated, how it has been engineered in a certain way to stave off certain kinds of excitation or to fail to acknowledge it or to parse it out somewhere else or convert it into anger. We don't know how the technology works even though we affirm our masculinity, which is surprising in some sense. Men are not going their own way. They're simply <laughs> in various ways in which all of these things become manly instead of all the others. It's not it's not it's not separatism. Yeah, I think it's yeah. it's really important to to push that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's 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 uh I'll just say it's um it's it's complicated and and you know, it, it's strange to hear myself saying this because I'm I'm very much influenced by queer theory and whatnot, but but I, I do think, you know, almost in an, in a Foucauldian sense, like we need to know the history of the present of the male body as it's shaped socially, ecologically, intersubjectively, economically, before we kind of jump to something else. Consciousness raising. <laughs> and unconsciousness. Unconsciousness lowering. Consciousness raising in the double sense, I think you get with someone like Matt, Matt Colhoun, you know, R-A-Z-I-N-G R and R-A-I-N-G. Ah, yeah, I like so, that. <laughs> flattening and then exploding of its own difference, a plastic explosion of a, what, 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 a, what a body can do, and in this case, what a male body can do because it's so locked up within its own genitalia. <laughs> yeah. We're just about over the hour mark. I'll kind of conclude by asking you one question. So in view of everything that we discussed today, by the way, it's great conversation. Thank you for coming on, Micah. I'm glad you reached you out guys. to me. I wanted to do Absolutely. a Hillman Thank episode, you. but I was confident, like I said, that they would come out of the woodwork with the mere mention of a name. <laughs> um, the Socius provides. Absolutely. And so I guess my, my final question would be, what is the current frontier of anti-capitalist critical psychology. What's the next step? What do teachers have to do? What do clinicians have to do? Maybe have to isn't the right word, but what would be a sort of advisable best path or advisable next step in our praxis? I think get out of the classroom and get out of the clinic. You know, not not leave entirely, uh, especially teaching. I think there's a lot of value to being a teacher, being a researcher, and being a clinician, you know, in the world we live in, individuals need help. And then some friends of mine have been doing liberation psychology work around this. Uh, Dr. Nisha Gupta has done some really cool work uh, on the streets of Pittsburgh. Mary Watkins has done a lot in various kind of activist spaces. I've done a little bit hoping to do more sort of aligning myself with anarchists, communists, and seeing what I can offer. And then, you know, what they can offer to me, how they can teach me. I, I don't necessarily disagree with Zizek when he says stop doing and think or whatever, because right. <laughs> there, there's a lot of value to that, uh, especially under neoliberal social justice efforts, I think can be sometimes a little short sighted. Yeah. But also do think and do would, would be my argument. Thank you again to Micah who helped us introduce many of our listeners and new folks to the work of James Hillman. In the meantime, look forward to new episodes of Acid Horizon. We have episodes on Foucault, Bataille, and Hegel coming up in the near future. In the meantime, find us on Patreon and please support us. Also find us on Twitter and Instagram and follow us there. Okay, we'll see you next time.